joined today by Jason Vinson. Thank you for joining me, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you being here. Any, anytime I get a chance to hang out with you is a great time. And we're going to be hanging out in real life soon. Very soon. Canada Photo yeah. Summit. And also WPI yeah. probably as yeah. well. We're more worried about the Canada Photo Summit, but WPI is fun. Yeah. <laughs> both of them. Go to both of them. <laughs> and you're doing a workshop here as well. Yeah. So yeah. if people are interested... Yeah. Uh, what what does that look like? Um, so it's going to be a full day. Usually we start like super early in the morning and there's going to be presentations, live demos, challenges, um, edit walkthroughs, as well as I walk through kind of my um, like no salesy way of selling albums, uh, if that makes sense. So or like the non-pushy way to sell albums. <laughs> I like yeah. that. And uh, that's happening at our studio yeah. here in Uptown Waterloo. So uh, if you're coming to Canada Photo Summit, also hang out with Jason for a bonus day and uh, have a nice time. Yeah. Learn some things and don't be a pushy salesperson. I don't sell albums, so I need, need to yeah, also you should chat, absolutely sell albums. Yeah, <laughs> I make a solid. I make a solid at least. You know, on average, I make about two thousand dollars extra on albums every wedding. Wow. Yeah. So the goal is like Damn. if you if you show up to the workshop, you're going to learn enough to make. All the money back within your next your next wedding. That's nice. That's a that's a very easy sales proposition. <laughs> but today we are going to be talking about off camera flash, off camera light, and then this is going to be a two part podcast. And the next part we're going to talk maybe a little bit more about albums and a little bit more about creating a sustainable business. So let's uh, begin with the off camera flash okay. slash off camera light. You are a little bit of a wizard, I think. You you think in a different way when it comes to off camera light. And do you want to talk maybe just your, your baseline when you walk into a scene, um, is off camera light something you go for, or is it trying to work with natural light first? Um, and when you approach a random new scene, what, what does that look like in your brain? Yeah. So, um, light is always number one, uh, whenever I walk into a scene. Um, and then from there, if there's really interesting light, then it's composition. And a lot of the times those don't line up, right? So I'll find some super amazing light and then the composition is just cluttered and crap or there's stuff in the way or just it's not going to work. Um, and so in that situation, then I start thinking about off-camera flash and how I can use off-camera flash with whatever compositions I see in the room. So it's kind of off-camera flash isn't always the go-to. Like I, I prefer to shoot natural light. Like I'll shoot and people think I'm like always shooting off camera flash. I'll shoot an entire wedding and not touch my flash for the entire day if the light's right. And I've done it before. Um, but off camera flash is just a tool to make a scene work when it, otherwise it wouldn't be ideal. Something. So there's a, f a few videos with you on the channel now. And one of the things that I found most interesting was your use of natural light that looked like it was off camera flash. So if I would have seen the photo um, specifically when we're on that stairwell and there's kind of the beam of light coming down, I would have thought that would have been a lit shot, but it's not. So I feel like a lot of your images that look like they're maybe off camera are actually just natural lighting, but when mixed in, uh, they disguise a little bit. Yeah, because because the goal is people know me as like an off camera flash photographer, so they see my images and they think it's off camera flash. But the goal is for my off camera flash stuff to be inspired by natural light. Like sometimes I take it over the top and like it's obvious it's off camera flash, but as a whole, it's inspired by natural light that I've seen like in real life. And that's how, that's really how I've learned how to use lighting. Cause I don't use modifiers really aside from like gels and stuff like that, gels and grids maybe. Um, but I don't carry around like soft boxes and crazy gobos and all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm basically trying to use the scene around me to modify my light. And what is your go-to kit for just a general wedding day? Does it change or is it pretty consistent? Um, it changes. It just depends on the situation. Uh, but my favorite light of all time that's kind of like my go-to uh, as of right now is the Ellen Chrome ELB 500 TTL. It's a pack and headlight. Um, so it's 500 watt seconds, but all of the like heavy internal battery and components and stuff like that is held in a pack that's down at the base of the stand. And then it's just this like little tiny ball of like the flash tube and an LED for a modeling light that sits on top of the light stand. So what that means is that um, I can have a high powered light, like 500 watt seconds, but I can use a really tiny light stand uh, because a lot of the times I would need a smaller light stand to hide it behind my couple. Um, or I, I travel a lot. I don't work with assistants. Um, so I'm carrying all my own gear. And so if I wanted to use like a, you know, like a Godox 8600 Pro 
and that so that light's giant on top of a stand, and so I need a heavier light stand. So it's just a lot more weight for me to have to carry. Yeah, it also from my anxiety and risk, um, I've had. I'm gonna say I've had 20 flashes kicked over on dance floors, so yeah. I like to have a smaller piece of kit up there when possible because I know kids just run into stuff sometimes. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, and then so like dance floor stuff, that, then I use like a Godox 8200 because um, I don't need as much power, and again, it's smaller, and I can keep it on smaller light stands and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and then I have tricks to make it so people don't run into your light stands. Ooh, can you? Can we? Uh, I I have other questions, but can we get to that, yeah. that uh, part it first? It might be hard to demo. I'm curious. Um, but basically, what I do is, whenever like the party dancing starts, people get out of their chairs, and I always want my light stand to be as close to the dance floor as possible. So I try. I, I want it like right on the edge, which is like the highest traffic Danger tripping zone. hazard yeah. area. So what I do is I just set it up by a table, and I grab two people's chairs, and I put it around the base of the stand. So there's like. The stands here, oh. and then I have put a chair up against it, and then a chair up against the other side because people aren't looking for my legs of a light stand, but they'll see a chair. And then it also it, like the that. legs of the chair also hide like the angle of the light stand, like the legs of it, and so it's no longer a tripping hazard, yeah. and people see the chair, and I can put it wherever I want. And at that point, people are up dancing around; they'll see that I'm using the chair, so they'll just grab another chair. So it's totally fine. Okay, I like that, and that sounds so simple. Yet it is something I always try to hide up beside, like the DJ table or something. Yeah, like DJ tables or like pillars and stuff like that. But like, you'll find a place and be like, "Well, this position isn't really ideal, but it's the best place." You know what I mean? So you end up making sacrifices. Whereas if you use this chair technique, you can literally put your light wherever you want. I'll even set up chairs like in the middle of a walkway, and people just be like, "Well, there's these random chairs here." And like, "Oh no, there's a light here." But at that point, people just know that I'm. I'm using it that way, and it is what it is. Yeah, I'm excited for your upcoming talk now, just on uh, <laughs> just on my, your light on my light stand trick, real life environments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess going back a little bit, I'm going to kind of section this off into let's talk first about um, off camera light in the daytime. So when you're doing maybe creative couples portraits, and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how you structure that when you get into um, kind of the reception. Yep. So when you are out with a couple and again, there's a few videos on the channel of us going for walks with couples. What is your, your general strategy uh, for kind of walking into say, say you're at a typical wedding venue, you have some options for some interior, some exterior. Uh, do you let the space inspire you or do you come in with some ideas? Um, sometimes I'll have ideas. I try not to location scout. I try not to have like an idea going into it. Um, because what used to happen in the past is we used to location scout a lot, especially when we do like destination weddings and stuff like that. And what would always happen is I would get an idea for a shot and then we'd go out there with a couple and something would change. The light would be just a little bit different to where it wouldn't work. Or like there's a hot dog cart in the way or someone like (laughs) moved a sign or there's tons of different reasons why it no longer works. But because I have the idea in my head, I try and make it work anyways, because it was part of the plan. Um, whereas if I had just showed up naturally, I never even would have gave, given the idea like a second thought just because it no longer works. Um, and so that's how I prefer to go into situations now is I don't like to location scout. I just like to have this is where I'm going to start. And so maybe it's um, a location where you know not much can change. It's in an area that I know is going to be shaded all day. So it's an easy place that I know I can just at least kind of get the juices flowing. And from there, we just kind of start walking. Um, a lot of the times, I'll just be like, the couple likes to hang out with each other, hopefully. You know, they're getting married and all that fun stuff. So I'll just be like, hang out for five seconds. I'm going to do a quick little loop um, and get an idea. And at that point, I'll just see something and then I'll drag them along. Sometimes I'll have an idea of like where I'm going to go, but I'm still constantly looking for other ideas. So I'm not opposed to being pulled aside from like where I'm on my way to. Um, as long as the light's right or I'm inspired by some sort of compositional element um, that I'm going to use off camera flash for or things like that. Yeah. And then in terms of uh, your most common uses, um, I've, Lindsay and I have been fortunate to be a model for one of your walks at WPPI. And uh, I think the thing, I, I think we kind of did a walk around just a dirty parking garage and you just replicated some natural light with off camera light. But I think the thing, and I might be wrong, but that seemed to be the, the biggest standout for people was when we were in, we were basically standing, we're at the Mirage Casino. So we were in like four trees, um, maybe fake trees. And you just replicated a sunset through there. And it was like the middle of the day. And it seemed to just like unlock a lot of things in people's minds. It was like, oh, I don't need to shoot 
in golden hour all the time that I can actually make this nice, warm backlit wraparound light. Yep. Um, is that a thing you do often? I know you backlight a lot. Um, is that one of the go-tos or is that um, just something that de- if you definitely backlight a lot, the recreating sunset, there's definitely some tricks that need to, um, be used in order to make it like realistic. Um, and so for me, mm-hmm. that situation was perfect because there was some layering. You, you need elements within your frame for the light to interact with. And so because we had like trees on the side of you, behind you, and in front of you, that light could kind of interact with the entire scene to kind of try and sell the sunset. And, pl- and also, even though there's buildings all around us, there was enough trees that I could hide the light to make it look like it's just like sun coming through a tree. Whereas if you just look through, it'd be like, well, sun can't come there because there's a building. But there was enough foliage to kind of hide the fact that there was a building right right behind us so you kind of need some you need stuff for the light to interact with and also a place to hide the light so it's believable that it's coming through there and then in terms of uh modifiers that you use you touched on that you use gels and that you use uh some other things like grids uh what is what do you find yourself using the most or what if somebody is kind of at square one they don't they haven't built a kit yet what should they start with yeah so um pretty much all the time, I have a, C- a full CTO gel on my on my flash, um, because in, in the situations that I'm backlighting, I always have a CTO gel. If I'm directly lighting a couple, um, then I'll a lot of the times take the CTO gel off, um, and it just from there just kind of depends on what I want to do with the colors. But most of the time, I like to play on these complementary colors of warms and cool tones, and so having a full CTO gel on my light. Yes, it makes the skin tones warm, but in general, I correct that in post with white balance adjustment, and that makes the scene kind of go a little cooler. Um, and so I almost always have a full CTO gel. And then from there, the grids that I use um, are only if I'm like directly lighting a couple or maybe like putting a spot of light on a wall or something like that. And CTO, for those that aren't familiar, uh, color temperature orange, yeah. just an orange gel. Um, if you do buy a flash, try to maybe get a kit that comes with uh, a few different filters. Um, and one of the other things that I really like about your work is um, kind of speaking to that CTO gel, that there's always a very rich contrast, natural contrast between colors usually. And I feel like you also work uh, a lot in Capture One to kind of bring that out and to bring that like really nice contrast out. Do you want to talk a little bit about your post-production, even though we can't really show it on screen right now? I don't like to add things. I don't add things to an image. So if you see an image, like if any sort of like Photoshop work was done to it, it was just to like maybe take out like, a sign or a light switch or a light stand or something like that. And then from there, I just try and like amplify color. So I try not to make a color there that was no, wasn't actually there. Um, but if it, there's like a little tint of blue, I'm not opposed to like cranking it up and making it like a hardcore blue, uh, if that makes sense. And so that's why I like to use the CTO gels because sometimes it doesn't necessarily give me the color punch that I want but it kind of gets the image in that direction. So it makes pushing and pulling those colors easier within post-production. I like that. Um, okay. So now moving from couples into more of the reception environment, uh, do you gel your flash there? Are you trying to match color temperatures or do you just let it go? No, I actually don't want to color match my temperatures because again, I like that play on colors. Um, so I almost always have a full CTO gel on my off camera flashes um, but those are always primarily as backlights. And then I have an on-camera flash for fill, and that's just a bare flash. And so I get the the like neutral light for my flash to light the couple or light the dance floor. Um, and then the backlight is always a really strong, um, warm tone. And then how many flashes would you typically set up, or is it kind of variable? Um, almost always, it's two off-camera flashes and one on-camera flash. Um, the off-camera flashes are almost always just backlighting, uh, and I almost always am only using one at a time. And so, if like if you look at the dance floor as like a square, and I'm shooting down at the bottom, I'll have a flash in this corner and a flash in this corner. Um, and depending on what direction I'm shooting, I'll turn off one light and then turn on another. And then if I go to shoot the other direction, I'll turn off that light and then turn on another. And if I'm shooting down the dance floor to where it's like perfectly symmetrical. At that point, then I'll maybe turn on both lights if it's something that I want to play with. But almost always, I'm just using a single backlight, even though I have two set up. And what controller are you using to be able to control? Kind of is it like on A and B groups? Yeah. So one, like one off-camera flash would be A. The other one would be B. Would be B. The on-camera is just the on-camera flash. It's like M or something like that on the trigger. I'm using the Flashpoint R2, I believe. 
Um, and just because it's easy because on the group buttons, I can just like double click one and I, I know that it turns on a light and I can like triple click one. And I know it turns off another one or whatever that that process is. I am very much a one one flash photographer at reception. So a one, one it, flash bounce. I, I feel like it's also or do you direct one flash bounce or uh, I'll do a little little okay. direct. Um, I'm typically not on a dance floor, so I feel like that's where the direct flash really starts to work. Um, and then, yeah, I pretty much just, uh, I'll go off camera usually with one light. If there's something bad happening that I have to like override, but otherwise, yeah, it's, um, it's cool that like, there's so many different ways to do a similar job and to, to make your couples happy. Um, so moving from reception to kind of those evening portraits, uh, I know you do, uh, do you, do you typically do like a 10, 15, 20 minute session with your couples? Um, at night? I try and keep it right around five minutes. Um, if it's an idea that I really want to try and work, then maybe it goes to 10. But normally what I do is um, after like the party dancing has started and I feel like I've gotten at least a decent amount of coverage, um, I'll take a break for a song or two and just kind of go wander around the venue, go outside, um, just try and be inspired by something that I see. Or um, nighttime situations are sometimes situations where I maybe go in and I have an idea because it's low light. So you can kind of do whatever you want. Um, and then mm -hmm. once I have an idea or I get something set up, I'll test it on myself or my second shooter. Or I'll just grab a random guest to kind of get things at least 90% of the way there. Um, and then once I kind of get things fine tuned a little bit, then I'll go grab the couple, get them set up. And then that way, when they get there, it's already almost completely done and set up. It's just kind of like a couple clicks and then they're ready to go. Um, fine tune a pose, maybe adjust the light a little bit. Um, and then they're, and then they're on their way. And then in terms of where people, where did, where did you actually learn off camera light or, or did you just na be naturally experimenting? Um, a lot of experimenting the, like the general concepts of it. I learned from Zach Arias, his one light workshop that he used to do way back in the day. Um, and so I got the DVDs or downloaded videos or whatever they were. Um, and so that's kind of how I got the general idea. And then as far as learning, the hardest part for me is like once I got the idea of off camera flash down and I understood like how to get everything set up, it was, the hardest part was learning how to like where to put the light. Like, do I put it here at 45 or 10 or like where, how do I set up this light? Um, and so then what, what I did is I started just going around just my everyday life looking for interesting light. And then when I'd see something that's interesting, I'd ask myself, what, what's causing that light? And then I'd see like, oh, is the sunlight coming through blinds or is it like reflecting off this mirror or like what's causing this interesting light? Um, and then how could I reproduce that light if it was no longer there? So is it a hard light? Is it a soft light? Is there a color to it? What angle is the sun coming through? How is it interacting with these elements of the scene? Um, and then you do that enough and then you go into a room where there is no light and you no longer see the light. You just see all these elements and then you have a, this like mental toolbox that you could pull through and you know like if I shine my light through this window at this angle it's going to create this hot spot on this wall and so you kind of go in with this like matrix mentality if you see you see the lines and the like color and all this stuff yeah I don't I don't see like that yet <laughs> maybe I, I need I need some work it's, it's definitely not <laughs> like it's not it's not something that I was just like born with like I definitely 100% trained myself to see that way yeah. And I feel like from, uh, you, you have photographed and you continue to photograph a lot of weddings. So I feel like from a, a mental creative space, it's nice to just be able to do something a little bit different and to be creative still after so many weddings into your career and stay fresh and excited to go to another one and see what other problems you can yeah. solve. Yep. That's, that's, that's probably one of my favorite things about wedding photography is the problem solving aspect of it. Yeah. And I feel like off camera light and, uh, just getting into that one, uh, if you're a natural light photographer and you're going into a scene, you obviously have to be able to problem solve on a basic level to get something that's also professional that matches your natural light work. But then once you really start to get into it, there are so many things unlocked and different ways you can light scenes and different ways you can keep yourself interested and just experiment, especially if you're there for a long time under the reception. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, like I love shooting natural light. Um, but the best thing about off camera flash is just being able to do what you would like set up a room to be an ideal situation. So like if you walk into a room and the natural light's absolutely perfect, like you could have that at every single 
place that you go if you know off camera flash and it will still look like like your natural light work because you're lighting it the way that you would ideally have it set up if the natural light was how you wanted it and uh where can people go to find out a little bit more about you and maybe uh learn some flash photography from yeah you? so um i do a, a ton of like behind the scenes uh videos and i like type out descriptions and try and help out as much as i can on instagram so that's uh at vincent images underscore jason v-i-n-s-o-n images underscore jason um, I also have some paid stuff on Patreon uh, where I go a little bit more in depth. Um, I walk through a, a bunch of editing. Um, I do a bunch of stuff. If I have an image, I'll explain exactly how it was lit and go from setup all the way through to the final image in post production. Um, so that's on, if you just Google my name, Jason Vinson Patreon, that'll pop up. Um, and then obviously, yeah, if you're going to be in the Waterloo, uh, Ontario area, uh, I got that workshop coming up. So that's going to be vincentimages.com uh, backslash workshops. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining me. And we're going to be back again for part two next week. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the business side of photography. See you next week. <laughs>